Good afternoon, everyone. This is John Shaw, the director of the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute. Thank you for joining us for another edition of Understanding Our New World. And we are privileged today to be joined by a remarkable man, Ambassador Charles Ray. Ambassador Ray has had two very distinct careers, at least two, there's actually several others, but he's been uh, both in the military and diplomacy. He uh, joined the military out of, out of high school, had a 20 year career, which included two tours in Vietnam, postings in other countries, won two bronze stars. Then in 1982, he decided he wanted to shift gears and took the foreign service exam, became a diplomat and rose through the ranks and became uh, ambassador to two countries, Cambodia and Zimbabwe. He retired in 2012 and has still had a very interesting wide ranging career. He teaches, he's a member of the board of directors of the Academy of American Diplomacy, a very respected group, uh, is also a member of the Association of Black Ambassadors. And Ambassador Ray also is a prolific writer. In fact, I'm jealous of his writing prowess. He's, and he, he's written in a number of genres. He's written mysteries, he's written westerns, um, he's written children's books, also has written uh, some nonfiction works, including a book that I read and would highly recommend, Things I Learned from My Grandmother About uh, Leadership and Life, and we'll talk about that. So Ambassador Ray, great to have you with us. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. It's uh, good to be here. It's good to virtually be back in Illinois. I hadn't, hadn't visited the state in a long time. Okay, well, we'd like to have you come in the real, <laughs> in, in reality, when we can, uh, when the circumstances allow. Ambassador Ray, let's just talk about your early life. It's so interesting in many respects. You grew up in, in Texas, a small town in Texas, um, and you describe your youth as being one in which you're both very introspective, read a lot, was kind of a quiet kid, but also what kind of broke out, you were, I think, the youngest president of your school. Uh, so tell us about those kind of dual aspects of your personality, both kind of a bookworm and then also jumping into the public arena. Well, yeah, I guess it's, uh, it's polite to call me a bookworm. I, uh, I was a recluse. I, I really, I would say the first, oh, 10, 11 years of my life, I'd much rather take a, a book, a bag with some snacks and a bottle of water and go into the woods and watch the animals. Or, or I had a little uh, laboratory that I jury rigged and attached to our smokehouse behind our house on the farm where we lived. And I spent a lot of time there breeding fruit flies and trying to cobble together a phonograph to copy Edison. So I, I really wasn't very good in dealing face to face with people. Uh, in fact, when I entered high school, I think at the ten tender age of 12, I got bumped up a grade. I walked into a classroom, two, two grades, the eighth grade, ninth, uh, ninth grade and 10th grade. Back in the, in the days, the schools had two grades per room with one teacher. I think the, the next youngest person in the room was two years older than me. I could not, there was only one per two people in the room that I could actually talk to. The teacher who I had known my entire life and my next door neighbor who, whose class I had been bumped up into. He and I were, he and I were buddies from the time we were started school. I started school a, a year behind him. I could not talk to, I couldn't get up in front of the class and recite. I, I, I didn't want to, I didn't talk to any of the other kids in the room. I'd walk in and get, go to the back of the room, open a book and sit there with my face buried in a book unless the teacher forced me. And she did. She literally started making me stop at the front of the room every morning when I came in and stand there like an idiot until I said something, even if it was nothing but good morning. I mean, it just, it was, it was excruciating torture is what it was. I mean, cruel and unusual punishment. But one morning, I worked nights at that time too. And one morning after we'd had a late shift, I worked uh, for a poultry company and I'll describe later what you do at night working for a poultry company. It's, it's not pleasant work. But after about eight hours of that, uh, go home, wash the smell of chickens off my body, eat a quick breakfast, and get to school, I was completely wiped out, so tired that I wasn't thinking straight. So when she stopped me in front of the classroom, I said something completely inappropriate, inane, and, and, and it just popped out. The class 
literally exploded. Kids fell off their chairs laughing. And I'm standing there thinking, and that was a stupid thing I said, and they're really stupid to laugh at it. And it suddenly hit me. Why should I be afraid to talk to people who mentally were probably five years younger than me? And it just, it sort of ended. Uh, and, and then my, 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 my friend William, who, who was also my neighbor, started putting the word around through the two classes that actually anyone in, the, in a, either of those two classes had trouble with their homework, they should come to me because I could probably help them since I had already read all of their books, both in the ninth and tenth grade. Um, and, and the shyness just sort of evaporated. I mean, uh, this inability to talk to people when I realized that I had no reason to be afraid of talking to people just went away. And later that year, this was this was in you know September. I think we had student council elections just before school broke for Christmas. And someone put my name in and I was unanimously elected as president of the student body, a, a position I held for four years in high school because no one else wanted it. Um, and that's how I became the youngest student body president in, in Shelby County uh, because I finally got over being able, being, being unable to talk to people. Actually, by the end of that year, I even had a girlfriend, first first girlfriend in my life. So that that's that's sort of my my academic career uh, summed up rather neatly. I I tend to uh, like to let other people start the conversation, but being an East Texan and you know Texans love to talk, I take it over. <laughs> Well, let's talk about that. In 1962, you joined the military. Uh, and in your book, you talk about, you know, to see the world. Um, and then, uh, you know, I think your po first posting was in Germany. Um, and then, you know, two tours in Vietnam, um, you know, other tours, two Bronze Stars. I mean, I'm sure there's a whole conversation to be had about the military service, but how did the military shape you in a fundamental way? How did, how were you different when you emerged from the military than when you entered you know, in 1962? Well, I think when I entered in 1962, I certainly wasn't uh, lacking in, you know, the, the desire to travel and try new things. I mean, I, as I said, I, I raised fruit flies. I, I built, I, I actually built a working 71 and a half RPM phonograph out of out of a, my mother's knitting needles and some cardboard and, and, a, and a, a bicycle chains and I mean it, it literally worked now, it ruined her collection of 75 RPM records but it worked uh, so you know I was no stranger to that what I think I lacked when I entered the army that I had when I came out was was how to how to organize myself my time sort of my thoughts um, and um, literally, I think I came out of the military still the push the envelope, uh, try to see what you can get away with type, but more organized at it. And that was, that was actually an advantage for me uh, as a junior foreign service officer that, and I had already, I had had two commands uh, two command positions when I was in the military. I've been on several senior staff, uh, senior staff jobs. So organizing, problem solving, identifying, picking apart and putting the things back together, solving problems. I think I, that's the main thing I got out of the military. I, that I have a sense of dedication, a sense of service. And also, as, as your 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 uh, your book, I mean, you talk about just the self education. I mean, because you are taking classes at a number of different schools. Uh, I think University of Maryland had an extension program. Um, maybe USC. I, th I know you got your degree at Benedictine College. So, I mean, it seemed like you also were kind of launched on a career, or at least intensified the sense of of always learning and trying to to kind of uh, self improve. Yeah, I, I mean, that, that was something that, that uh, another thing that, that my grandmother sort of pushed into me is that you should try and learn something new every day. If you don't learn something new, you've wasted, you've wasted a day. 
when, when I when I graduated from high school, 1962, uh, I was a valedictorian, and back then valedictorians got a $500 scholarship to a land grant university. Uh, the problem I had is I didn't know where the next 500 would come from. And I wanted to get out of Texas. I wanted to see the world. I'd, I'd seen pictures of the world in National Geographic magazines, and, and I wanted to put my feet down in some of those places. So I joined the Army. And uh, as soon as I arrived in Germany in 1963, uh, I started taking courses at University of Maryland, their, their overseas program. Um, and I found that I actually, the first few college courses were a little rough because I, I came out of a segregated high school where I probably knew more than most of the teachers just because I read so much. So being in a classroom with other students who were smarter and with a professor who actually knew what he was talking about was a new experience. Once I got used to it though, I found I actually, I actually liked it. I, I liked going to school. I mean, I, between 1963 and when I finally got my bachelor's degree in 1971 or two, I think I attended about seven, 10 different colleges or universities, University of North Carolina, uh, Morgan, uh, Catholic U, American University, University of Maryland. I mean, I, I, I had transcripts. I had a stack of transcripts when I applied for my year to, to finish my degree at Benedictine. I had a stack of transcripts about half an inch thick and enough credits for actually two degrees. Well, so tell us about television and, and uh, 1982 to take the Foreign Service exam, I guess in 81, and then actually to enter the Foreign Service. I mean, what uh, did you feel like, you know, what was the impetus? Was that, in some ways you say it was kind of a foul on to your military career, but did you also see it as something of a departure? I have to be honest with you. I mean, it, it, it wasn't a planned transition. I had, I was, I was, I had already submitted my request for retirement from the army and I had been offered a job at the uh, El Paso International Airport uh, in, in public relations. And I wasn't sure that I was cut out for the nine to five, looking at the same workmates every year for the rest of my life routine. I was working at the time at the Defense Language Institute in Monterey and in the Slavic language department. And, and at lunch times, I would go to the Presidio Library and do what I like to do. I would eat a quick lunch and I would go read and talk to the librarian and just basically chat about things. Our, the, our librarian there was a French Senegalese lady who was married to one of our sergeant majors. And I don't think she'd even gotten her US citizenship at the time. I was lamenting one day about my fear that if I when I got out and if I took a nine to five job, I might become an alcoholic or who knows, or a wife beater. I, I just, I really worried about it. I, I wasn't sure that I could make the transition. And she suggested the foreign service. Uh, the funny thing about that is it, during two of my military tours, the first tour in Vietnam and my first tour in Korea, I worked with people at the embassy in Saigon and at the embassy in Seoul frequently. Had no idea how they got their jobs because they never talked about it. They, the State Department didn't do a very good job of recruiting in those days and they, they just did not recruit on military bases. But she found an old book about the Foreign Service that was so old it predated postal zip codes and helped me get the address for the Bureau of Examiners here in Washington. We, I wrote away, got the exam, almost didn't take it because I overslept that Saturday morning uh, and I had to drive to San Jose from, from Fort Ord in California through the fog, M made it with about three minutes to spare, took the exam, went home and collapsed, 
uh, about a month later, I was told I had passed it. And then I went to San Francisco, I think in April of 1982, took the oral. In June, I was told that I had passed the oral. And since I was retiring from the army, I had a had an active security clearance. So the security check was pro forma. They sent a diplomatic security service agent to the housing development I lived in on Fort Ord. He talked to a couple of my neighbors and submitted a report. And that was that. The Army did my physical, so I didn't have to have a physical exam. And they called me one day and said, we have a class starting in August. You know, if you're, if you're interested, you can do it. And the unfortunate thing about that is my retirement date was actually set for September. So I had to go and talk to our personnel officer who said, okay, you're, you know, you're, you're actually, a re I wasn't a regular army. I was a reservist for 20 years. Put yourself on leave and, you know, go do what you want to do. Just don't violate the uniform code of military justice in the process. So pack the family up, pack our goods, ship them to Washington, drove across country with the wife and two kids in a station wagon that we owned, reported to uh, the Board of Examiners, which was in Rosslyn at the time. In fact, the Foreign Service Institute was in Rosslyn. And I started, I checked into the Foreign Service on August 10th. I retired from the Army on September 1st. <laughs> So some overlap. So almost there. a month. Almost a month. I actually, I literally double dipped. I, I, I received active foreign service pay and active military pay for for that month. Yeah. Well, I mean, your your diplomatic career has many many interesting features. One that that's, that's striking to me is that one of your a, a critical assignment was to be the consul general in Ho Chi Minh City. You know, going back to Vietnam. Tell us about that experience. What was it like to go back, you know, as a diplomat, a place you had been twice before as a, as a military man? Well, I mean, I, I, when we, we actually, when we went to Vietnam, we went first to Hanoi, a place I had never been, and a place I was actually nervous about going to. Um, and, and that was a little unsettling when, when we landed at Hanoi because the, the Hanoi Airport at that time had, they hadn't really modernized it like it is now. It, it really was a, it really did look like a third world airport. Um, and even though I still spoke a little Vietnamese, I, I didn't understand the Northern dialect that well. And whenever I spoke, uh, the Northerners would just giggle themselves silly because I had such a strong Southern accent. And I don't mean Southern U.S., <laughs> but I think the most the two two things that really stand out about going going back to Vietnam for me is when we flew from Hanoi to Ho Chi Minh City for my first day officially as Consul General at post. When we were coming in for a landing at Tanjanut Airport, the old concrete revetments that they parked the airplanes in when I was there in the 60s and 70s were still there. I mean, it was it was really freaky to look out the window of the plane and see these revetments as we were coming in to the runway. And I, my last tour there, I actually worked in a building that was only about a half mile from those revetments and from the runway. And I could I could eat, actually see my building from the plane. That was that was freaky. And and then the other thing that was, I guess, equally Freaky was to find that some of the people that were the most welcoming, the easiest to talk to, um, were people who were former Viet Cong. I mean, the mayor of Saigon, uh, Mayor of Ho Chi Minh City at that time had been a, an ammunition battalion commander in the Delta during my last tour. And we became we're still friends. I mean, we still exchange emails. We play golf with each other three or four times a month. Uh, we would sometimes host joint dinners for the consular corps where he and I would sit and tell war stories and, and, and watch the other consuls general sit there with their eyes agape. How can these two guys who weren't enemies 
be so close to each other. Uh, I think that 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 struck me more than anything was how how the the Vietnamese got had gotten over the war much better than, than most of the Americans I I, I know. Uh, you know, and it was just, I met Hanoi Hannah. I mean, I, I had tea with Hanoi Hannah. I became friends with the guy. Uh, Tran Bac Dang, who was the commander of the Viet Cong assault on our embassy in '68, um, that that those those things stand out in my mind. I mean, the fact that 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 uh, the Vietnamese were welcoming. I, I'd go out to visits to the countryside, and old people would come up, and they found out I still spoke a little Vietnamese. I I remember once being in a group that the foreign ministry was taking to tour some of their rural projects. And this little old lady singled me out of the crowd of, of diplomats, walked up to me, stood next to me, and she asked me in Vietnamese, Are you American? And I said, yes. You GI? I said, yes. She took my hand and she stood there and held my hand for the entire program. And that that almost, you know, just how do you how do you describe something like that? It's 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 uh, it was a it was an experience that that I'll never I'll never forget. Right. That was my return to Vietnam. I mean, it was, I, I think someone said it well, um, and it might have been the mayor of Ho Chi Minh City, said, you know, uh, war's like a football game. The two sides fight each other. They try to take each other's heads off. But when the referee blows the whistle for the end of the game, they go take a shower and go out and have a beer together. <laughs> that was sort of the way they looked at it. You know, he said, we fought, we've been fighting the Chinese for a thousand years. We fought the French for a hundred years. We fought you guys for 10 years. Why do you think it's such a big deal? I don't, I don't understand that. And, and he's right. He, he is in, 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 in historical terms, our involvement in Vietnam is, is just a tiny blip on their historical radar. Right. Well, let's talk about the two ambassadorships that you held. I mean, very different countries, Cambodia, and Zimbabwe. Take us through kind of the nature of each of the assignments and how they're alike and how they were different. Oh, well, Cambodia was interesting because at the time, Cambodia was not very high on, actually neither, were high on U.S. strategic priorities. And in fact, the, the policy for Cambodia was essentially decided by a staffer on the House Appropriations Committee who had a, an abiding interest in Cambodia, who had close ties with the opposition, who hated the prime minister, uh, and who controlled the State Department budget. And so in return, he also had a thing about Burma, which was low on the priority list. And so in return for him not tampering with the State Department budget in other areas, they, they literally let this kid and I say kid because I think he was in his early 30s, they let him run Cambodia policy. In fact, when, when I uh, was doing my calls before going, the, the, the country director scheduled a meeting for, he was the only congressional staffer. I met with members of Congress, but this one congressional staffer I had a meeting scheduled with and in the car going to, to the Capitol Hill for the meeting, the, the uh, escort who went with me says, whatever you do, don't disagree with him or upset him. Okay, whatever. Uh, and the meeting went relatively well until he started talking about uh, the, the, the um, International Military Education Training Program, or IMAT, and he didn't know what he was talking about. And I ran the, that program when I was deputy chief of mission in, in Sierra Leone and, and had been trained at uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in managing these programs. And so I stopped him in mid-sentence and I said, I basically just said to him, you have everything bass backwards. He said, you, you have, you don't, that's not how it works. And then I walked him through. The poor guy from the State Department, who was my escort, was sitting there on his chair, literally quivering, <laughs> wanting to tell me to shut up. But I was bigger than him. I was older than him. I was an ambassador. I mean, I was a consul general, and I think he was an FS3. He didn't dare do it. Uh, but gr uh, 
the guy won't mention the name of it for, 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 for privacy reasons, but this staffer listened to me for a while and then he sort of looked at me and he goes, oh, I didn't know it worked that way. And that was the end of the meeting. We shook hands and I left. The staffer on all the way back to the State Department, I don't know if you should have done that. And it turned out that uh, over the course of my tenure at in Cambodia, uh, this staffer and I actually became friends because one thing he said to me when I went to see him at the end of my tour, when it was over, is I was the only person at the State Department that he could disagree with, but still respect. <laughs> but no, the question you asked though was, you know, what, what, was, what were the challenges? That was one of the challenges was to, to take uh, control of the policy making toward Cambodia away from Capitol Hill where it doesn't belong and put it back in the State Department where it does. And in order to do that, I took it from him and I took it uh, because no one back, no one over at State wanted to run afoul of this guy. They didn't want to touch it. Uh, the other was that because Cambodia was such a low priority, there hadn't been a lot of interaction with the government. And so other than working on HIV AIDS programs, uh, working on a few counter drug programs and working on demining, those were about the only contacts we had with the government. This is post 9-11 and we were worried about Muslim extremism and, and, and Islamic terrorists. I didn't realize it until I got there that very few people in the State Department in Washington realized that about 5% of Cambodia's population is Muslim, the Cham Muslims, who also happen to be the people that we bombed mostly when we went into Cambodia in support of the Vietnamese, uh, the Arvin military in the 70s. And so they didn't have any reason to like the US. And I found out later that they were also being radicalized by the Jamaa Islamiyah group out of Indonesia with support from Saudi Arabia. Not having contacts with the military, effective contacts with the military, not having effective contacts with the police, we had no way of, of getting information about who was coming and going and who was doing what. It, it came to a head when we discovered by accident when a Jamaa Islamiyah bomb maker was arrested in Thailand. And when they searched him, they found a cell phone showing dozens of calls to Cambodia. And when they interrogated him, they found out that he was part of a plan to bomb either the American or the British embassy in Phnom Penh. And the only thing that prevented it from happening was that Cambodian students had become incensed at a Thai soap opera that they felt insulted their culture. They rioted burning Thai businesses and burning the Thai embassy and the border was closed. That was what saved, what saved our bacon. And at that point, it was just, it was, I mean, I just decided this, this is, this is ridiculous. We cannot sit here and, and put, put blindfolds on in the, in light of this. And we have a potential, a potentially radicalized population around us. Uh, we have a, a government that we don't talk to the people who control the flow of people across the borders. That has to change. And uh, I mean, that, 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 that was a challenge. You had a prime minister, he's a dictator. But, you know, most frankly, in, in my view, the ones I met uh, when I served in, in Asia in the military and in the, in the Foreign Service in, in Thailand and other places are dictators of a sort. Uh, and if the Cambodians can put up with it, why should it bother us? So the problem was developing a relationship with the prime minister that would allow me the, the freedom of movement to do the things I needed to do to protect American citizens and to get other uh, US policy things done. Uh, trafficking in persons, for example, Huge problem in Cambodia. Um, kids as young as five. We, we, we finally got a program started. And in one of the first raids, they found two five-year-old girls who had been sold by their parents into a brothel. You know, that, that 
kind of issue required being able to, as I said to a member of Congress, work with people that I sometimes have to criticize. And I, and I, and I mentioned this to uh, actually was, uh, Congressman Rohrabacher from California. I can disagree with someone without being disagreeable. And, and that's the essence of diplomacy is you, if you're honest, if you're straightforward and if people can trust your word, and as long as you're not being condescending or gratuitously rude, you know, I, you know, I think in, in, in most of the world, people accept that we're not always going to agree. It's how we disagree that, that matters. And so that, that was the big issue in, in Cambodia is human trafficking and the, the issue of a Muslim population that could be radicalized and, and turned against us uh, in a, in a some really terrible ways if we weren't careful. I mean, right, we found out, for example, that the bomb plot that they were hatching, they had settled on the British embassy. I had a, I had an energizer bunny of a security officer who was constantly doing things to the fence and changing patterns at the gate. And they decided the British were more predictable. They, they followed us. And so they, they, they had gone so far as to rent a garage, buy a truck, and they were gathering the explosives, they had problems finding someone willing to drive the truck bomb because it would have been a suicide mission. And then, of course, the riots happened and they couldn't move back and forth. But, but that's how close we came to, to a disaster. And, and the challenge was to prevent things from getting to that point again, to change the dynamics so that we were actually involved in a, a an active bilateral not we weren't friends i mean although the cambodians would at that time have, have not minded being friends but we didn't have the type of relationship where you could get things done i mean we were working on combating aids we were working on combating childhood mortality rates a little bit on the drugs thing we were doing quite well in demining but if a citizen got in trouble in, in one of the remote provinces of Cambodia, we weren't in a position to really do much to help them because we didn't have that kind of a relationship with the police or with the military where we could actually get into some of these areas. I, I, I have to say, and I don't know if anyone's done it since or before, I think I was the first American ambassador to visit every single province in the country of Cambodia. You know, I, I literally and some of them were three-day bone-jarring trips over some really lousy roads, but I went to every province in that country. Let's talk a little bit about just the military and, and the diplomatic service, and, and, and particularly in the context of, of the racial tensions that we've been talking about. And it's sometimes said that, um, that the military has been the one institution in American life which has done a reasonably good job of fostering this sense of inclusion and common endeavor, whereas the diplomatic service has always been seen, often been seen as elitist and kind of disconnected from real America and frankly, discriminatory. And I know you've recently written a really powerful essay about some of your experience as an ambassador coming back to the United States and being you know, treated rudely and, and disrespectfully by border guards. So if you can just kind of pull together just these two institutions and how you think they have done in terms of fostering a sense of uh, diversity and inclusion in the US. Well, I mean, there's, there's actually, there's no doubt that the military has done a much better job at, at diversity and inclusion. Um, and, and part of it, I think, is that it, it's a difference in the culture of the two organizations. In, in, in the State Department, for a while, they were actually doing a fairly good job in recruiting. They, they were getting adequate representative numbers of the various uh, underserved groups, but where they weren't doing really anything, in my view, was working on the inclusion part and the retention. Uh, and and that's, that's a big difference in state and, and the military. In, in state, you come in, and, and, and basically the education you come in with, unless you fight to get more, is the education you will re 
retire with because while while the State Department has some very good what what they call trade craft or or you know uh, vocational education training if you will it really doesn't have an education program and and the military on the other hand you know that that the average military officer in a twenty five a twenty year career will spend 25% of his or her time in long-term training unrelated to their military occupational specialty. I mean, this is, you know, getting advanced degrees and, and you know, taking courses, work. That is almost unheard of in the Department of State. We, we've had a few programs, but a lot of them have died. They, they find it hard to find people who are, who are you know, who get out of the work and, and, and performance evaluation system to do it. And it's not encouraged. It's neither encouraged nor necessarily rewarded. I remember when I was in for 30 years, every time I came back from an overseas tour, I would carve out a week or two to go and take a course over at FSI. Uh, I took early morning French. I took a course on negotiations. I mean, I, I, I took the courses because I, I just I sort of like that classroom environment. I had people look at me funny. I mean, why are you killing time? Actually, I had someone say, why are you wasting so much time going to those courses at FSI? You should be out working for your next EER. And my response to that is, education is never a waste of time. Mm -hmm. But to you know, in the in the State Department culture, if it's not directly related to the assignment you're going to, and preferably as brief as possible, you know, language training is, is sort of the exception, it's considered not career enhancing. And and that's that's really, really sad. In the military, it's the other way around. I mean, you, uh, they, they make all kinds of efforts. I, I'm a graduate of the Command and General Staff College, which is the Army training for field grade officers. And, and, and they had a program, if you didn't get selected for the full-time residence course, you could actually take a correspondence course for a year. And if you passed it, then you went for, uh, I think it was eight weeks to Fort Leavenworth and you did a residence portion to, to get your, to get your uh, diploma. We don't have anything like that in the Department of State. It just, we, we literally don't. Uh, I, uh, as, a, uh, as an FSO, I was sent to the Army War College's course for newly promoted one and two star generals where they teach them to be uh, component command ground force commanders. They wanted to include civilians in the course to be able to give the, the participants a broader look at the government that they work for. The State Department had a hard time finding people who, who were willing to, to, to go. I mean, it was, it, was, uh, it was really unfortunate in a way. So it, I guess the, the, the a long answer to a short question is because the military focuses on educating a person, not just as an infantryman or an artilleryman, but as a member of the military in service to the country from the day you walk in until the day you walk out, you're constantly involved in, in education and development. There's more of a cohesive sense of identity um, I mean, you'll find, for example, that a lot of the issues, the, 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 the conflicts about the State Department you, you hear happening here in Washington don't often happen overseas. And it's a lot like the difference between being at a base in the U.S. and being in combat. When the bullets start flying, colors disappear. All you, all you want to know is if the guy next to you can do his job. Well, at embassies, it tends to, smaller embassies especially, because people are so dependent upon each other, a lot of these differences sort of sort of get pushed aside. The difference there, though, is that the military people, you have this, this well-organized support structure back here for, for Foreign Service, for State Department people, you don't. I mean, someone asked me the other day if there was 
a program in state for people suffering PTSD or TBI. And as far as I can tell, there is no formal, I mean, there's no support network for people who are suffering from stress from their assignment. And there wasn't when I was in. So I think that that's, that's a big thing. And, and I guess the other, finally, I'll say this, is that at DOD, they are more willing to confront and speak truth to power on issues than they are. A state is very non-confrontational. If, if people above the Secretary of State or the Secretary himself, because he's a politician, say, we're going to do this, then, then the rest of the bureaucracy and state just sort of shrugs, and, you know, looks the other way. In, in, in uh, the example, I guess, would be General Miley going public with the, about the incident at the church in Washington and apologizing and saying, had he known that's what was going to happen, he would not have done it. You didn't hear any such demural from the Secretary of State. And you won't. You, you never will, uh, unless you have a Colin Powell in that job. Right. So, so I think, I mean, in a way, I think that's the main contributing factors to, to the, the military doing a much better job than, than the State Department in that regard. Right. Well, when you retired then in 2012, I mean, you, uh, you went on to, uh, you continue to have a pretty robust career. I mean, you're teaching. And let's talk a little bit about your writing too, because you have, you've, you've, you've moved into a lot of different genres that we do not always uh, think about as being kind of connected. I mean, mystery writing, Westerns, uh, children's books. Tell me about, and then also I know you, you're, you're an avid cartoonist, you're a photographer. How do all these pieces come together? Well, I mean, it, I have time that I carve out during a day or a week uh, to do each. I mean, when I when when I'm when I'm writing right now, I'm working on three books at the same time <laughs> because and I do that because it keeps me from getting bored. I have my little rough outline. I work on one if it starts to get a little boring or you know, or I run into, a, I'm not sure what my character should do next year. I need to step away from this and think about it. I go work on one of the others. And I find that by, by doing that, it, it keeps it all fresh. And then when I just get tired of writing after about six hours, I go get my brushes or my pens and I paint or I draw or I grab my camera and I, I have a huge forest park behind my house. I just take off through the woods to take pictures. Um, and uh, so they, they, they're not, and even in the writing, I mean, they, the various genres aren't related to each other. They just happen to be things I like. I mean, I don't, I, I read almost every, I don't read romance novels. I, I, I can't read, nor can I write them. I just, not, I'm not wired that way. Uh, and there's a lot of the what's called Christian literature that I find difficult to read because it's so dogmatic and preachy. But everything else is fair game. I mean, it's like music. I I like country and western and blues. Go figure. Uh, so and so I'm the same way when I write. I I keep about ten notebooks on different topics and I write down things as they come to me. And, and literally I've got 10 notebooks that are almost full of projects to be done, thoughts that come into my head. Uh, a book I wrote once uh, that was popular for a few months uh, called Angel on, on My Shoulder. And it was a book about a 40 something year old guy who never left the nest. He still lived with his parents. He was, you know, the Casper Milk Coast. People pushed him around. He let him get away with it. And his grandmother came back as a ghost uh, to sort him out. And, and the thought for that book came to me. I was, I was reading a newspaper article about the, 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 the kids who, you know, they return to the nest, the, the children who come back home in their 20s and 30s to live with their parents. And I, I sort of a what if question popped into my mind. What if there was a guy who never left? How would his parents and how would the world deal with that? And it just sort of developed into this hilarious story about a guy who's, and, and I, I put my, my, my own grandmother was a tiny little 
fire ant of a woman. And so she became the grandmother in the, in the story uh, who, who appeared to him at the most inopportune times. <laughs> And and that I mean that's how it how it comes about. I'm, or or I'll I'll be doing research for something and I'll see something else. I mean, or I'll be talking to someone and they'll say something and it just triggers a thought. That's that's how that's that's how the ideas come. And that's why that's why I don't restrict myself to a specific genre because that's not how your mind works. I mean, you know, you don't think of a single genre. You think of a lot of things. And and I write about the things that I think about and care about. Now, and then you're working on a Western, and I think you you have an African American marshal as one of the protagonists. Is that right? Actually, well, actually, I've, okay. I have to. I've, I'm not working on a Western. I've 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 written in the last two years. I think I've written about twenty five or thirty westerns. I have a fairly broad list of characters. I have an African-American vigilante, uh, a, an African-American Civil War veteran with PTSD who's made a deputy sheriff. I have a woman who's a sheriff in a small Arizona town who has, uh, shall we say, sexual identity issues. Uh, I do one about a Texas Ranger who is half black, half white, passing for white. I mean, so, and, and the reason I, I, I do this is because, I mean, these type characters actually populated what we think of as the Wild West. I mean, for example, 10% of the U.S. military west of the Mississippi from 1875 to 1900 was African-American. 25% of all the ranch hands and cow hands were African-American. So you had a fairly colorful West I'm just trying to put some color back into the picture. Wow. And, and, and addressing issues, you know, for example, uh, the, the post-traumatic stress of war, or battle fatigue or shell shock or whatever you call it, it didn't get invented in World War I. I mean, can you imagine the mental impact on the men who came out of the Civil War? I mean, what it must have done to their minds? Some of those battles make World War II battles look like you know, wrestling match. And so I think, how would people have dealt with a shell shock war veteran back then? Or a woman who's not sure she is feminine, you know? How would, how would society, how would a town deal with it? And I try to, I do the what if exercises in my head and I, and I, um, and, and you know, I that's 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 how I write it. So it's you know now you know not all my main characters are in fact African American. Uh, I also treat the Native Americans. Uh, I try to do it accurately. I mean, not all of them. I mean, they weren't a bunch of savages out to scalp every white person they came across. They a lot of them were just fighting to get land back that was stolen from them in the first place. Some of them never fought. I mean, I'm. Uh, some of my ancestors are Cushado, which is an East Texas Indian tribe, and they never fought, they never fought against the U.S. I mean, they were farmers who, who, when they were told to go to a reservation, they packed up and went. So you know, it, it's uh, it's uh, trying to show the the issues and the people of the West as I think they really were, not this sort of watered down, I'm gonna use the term, I don't wanna sound politically incorrect, but I don't, I, don't, I don't like the whitewashed version that I grew up being taught. Mm -hmm. You know, not all of the cavalry were blonde, blue-eyed Irish. Right. You know, they, there, there, were, there, were, there were African-Americans, there were Hispanics, uh, there were women who, who you know, West of the Mississippi, you had women doctors and lawyers and judges well before women had the right to vote, simply because there weren't enough people with the skills to be discriminating. I mean, I told someone once, if you were in a town and someone shot you, you're not going to check the doctor's gender when he or she comes to take the bullet out. You're going to lay there and hope they know what they're doing. 
So, so that, I mean, that's, and that's just, that's it. But that's, that's my, uh, and otherwise they're just, you know, they're just Westerns, you know, the Louis L'Amour, Zane Gray type Westerns. They just have different, different characters, same type situations, you know, it's man against nature, um, a quest to conquer whatever, whatever the, you know, the knights of the, the knights of the plane. But yeah, that's, you know, again, that's a long answer to a short question. No, that's <laughs> But let me ask you, we, if we can maybe turn to a couple of questions we received from our audience. Yeah. And, and the first one actually comes from Ed, who had worked with you in Cambodia uh, a number of years ago. And he's one, first of all, he extends his, his best wishes to you. And he mentions, or he asks the question about whether the U.S. withdrawal geopolitically from Southeast Asia generally and Cambodia in particular has opened the field for China, Chinese influence. Oh, that's no doubt about it. Um... The, the fact is that whether we're there or not, and whether we're engaged or not, the Chinese will be there. They have been there. When I left Cambodia in 2005, the Chinese were all over the place. They were building roads. They were opening Chinese language centers. They were building power plants, renovating power plants. Uh, but when we ignore or, or sort of minimize our relationship with Southeast Asia, with the exception of Vietnam, a, a country that will never be very friendly with China, uh, the rest of the countries there will really have not much choice but to fall under Chinese sway. I mean, we, we, we were the for a while, I think we were probably Southeast Asia's biggest trading partner and as a group of nations. And, and when we start to minimize that, you know, the Chinese are going to come in and, and, and they're going to, they're going to take over. And so, yeah, when we ignore Southeast Asia, uh, Southeast Asia will become more and more uh, under, will fall more and more under sway of China. Okay. And I don't think that's necessary. We can't get rid of them, and I don't say we should necessarily be at loggerheads with them, but we need to be aware that not all of what they do benefits us or that's to our advantage, nor is it necessarily to the advantage of the countries there. So, you know, we, we need to be engaged. We cannot go back to the isolationist attitude of the 1930s. That's that's just not possible. You know, we, it's, it's unsustainable unless we want to become the complete total outlier of the world, the, the, the country that everyone else sort of looks at sideways uh, and avoids as much as possible. Uh, Ambassador, we have a question from Charles from Hoffman Estates, Illinois, wondering if you uh, drew any particular lessons from the examples of two other uh, gentlemen, George Marshall and Colin Powell, who move from the military into the diplomatic realm. Are there some kind of common themes, do you think, in the, uh, the kind of skills they brought from one, one discipline to, to, the, to the other? Yeah, in a way, and, and they're similar, um, and that is that you, you should always keep your mind focused on what it is you're trying to achieve but keep your ears and your heart open to advice from others on how to how to do it. And then there's a there's a military mantra that I that I like um, that that really should be applied across the board. And that is, you know, the old saying, "Mission first, people always." Uh, and I think this was what basically, and Omar Bradley is another that I that I add to that is that while they could be very forceful in getting things done, they never forgot that they didn't get it done by themselves. I mean, you, you, you the person in charge, decide what needs to be done, but the people under you are the ones who do it. And the day you forget or neglect those people is the day you fail. And you had some dealing 
Colin Powell, didn't you, in terms of being able to see him, how he managed and his, I think you particularly know that his, 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 his kind of habit of just kind of walking around and talking to people and not always following the exact line of command. Yeah, no, that, that was, uh, I actually knew him uh, before he retired. I, when I, this was after I retired, I was assigned to Washington in 1990, 1991 to 1993. He was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and he and I actually served on a refugee committee together. And so, so you know, that was the first time we had actually, we actually met. But, but just a, an example of his, his way with people and his sort of, despite his status and stature, way of dealing with everyone. He presided over my swearing in ceremony for when I went to Cambodia. And, and, and part of that ceremony is your, your family comes in, my, my wife and my kids and, and their, their, you know, fiancés and everything. And my, my older brother and, and his, his crew uh, and a, a, I'm not sure what you call the niece of a niece, but I, I have a niece in California who had a daughter going to school at NYU who played hooky that day to come down to attend my swearing in. And they're all lined up and you get to introduce your family to the person who's swearing you in, in this case, the secretary. He comes into the room and I'm going down the road. I mean, you know, this is my wife and this is my son. This is my daughter. This is, you know, this is his girlfriend. This is her fiance. Uh, and I'm, here's this is my older brother and this is his oldest daughter. And, blah, blah. and I got to my Grand niece, I guess you would call her, and I blocked on her name. Mm. I, I I sometimes have problems re remembering names. Powell knew me well enough to know from my body language and the look on my face that I had just gone blank. And he pushed past me, grabbed her hand, and started flirting with her and talking to her, and in the process got her to tell him what her name was. And and then he moved on. And my my the both niece, even my daughter, they were so flabbergasted that Colin Powell would actually do that. It was years later when I told her why he did that that she realized it was because I had forgotten her name. She completely missed the fact that I never introduced her to Colin Powell. And that was the way he was. He would go down to the cafeteria, he would get his lunch. And he would go and join some employee at the table and just talk to them at lunch. But that's, this is what you're taught in the military is that you're in charge. Everybody knows you're in charge. You don't have to go around saying, I'm the man in charge. I mean, you're the commander. Everyone knows you're the commander. A good commander occasionally has mess with his troops. He sometimes goes into their barracks and he sits there and, and he talks to them while they polish their boots. I mean, it, you know, he goes to the motor pool and he talks to the mechanics in the motor pool uh, because every individual in the organization is critical to the organization. And if, if, if the guy in the motor pool doesn't do his job, your, your vehicles don't run. If the cooks in the mess hall don't like you, you probably don't want to eat in that, that place because it, it could be, you know, it, and and I think the, the military teaches you that that skill or or the necessity of doing that, and and that 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 is what I learned from their, you know, from them, from from Powell, from from Marshall, uh, from from uh, Bradley, is that yeah, you focus on getting the job done, but just remember the people. You don't focus on them too. The job won't get done. I mean, you can focus on the job all you want to, but if you ignore your people, that focus is wasted because they're not going to do the job. Right. Well, let me just ask you finally. I, 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 read, I read an interview in which you were asked uh, to describe your favorite place, and you said, "You know, I've been everywhere. I don't really have a favorite place, but if you're going to press me, my favorite place is the place I haven't been to yet." Yeah. Um, 
is there a place that uh, that's on your uh, once this COVID passes that you'd love to go to that you just for whatever reason have not made it to but you'd love to to go? Well, there are actually a, there are actually a number of places. Uh, one is Yellowstone Park. Uh, two is Antarctica. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I've never been to Yellowstone. I just, I want to go to Yellowstone. I wouldn't mind going to the Black Hills or Mount Rushmore, uh, but Yellowstone, I, I really, and, I, and I, oh, and, and, and El Capitan in Yosemite. I've been to California hundreds of times, but I've never seen El Capitan and I, I want to do that. And I want to go to Antarctica. I just, I, I want to, I want to set foot on Antarctica before I'm too old to do such a thing. Surely you could place one of your mystery novels in Antarctica, can't you? Maybe. I, I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ambassador Ray, thank you so much for your time. It's really been a delight to have you and to just give us Enjoy. some impressions of, of your interesting and rich career. So uh, thank you so much for your time. We really enjoyed it. My pleasure. I had a ball. Great. Thank you so much. And right. thanks all to you for joining us for another edition of our series, Understanding Our New World. Please feel free to follow us on social media and also to look at this interview, which will be up in a couple days on our YouTube channel. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.